This video is going to cover our last section of notes, um, and this is going to also cover our nuclear reactions. So we'll do a little bit of practice of nuclear reactions and also talk a little bit about half-life and how we go about doing those calculations as well. Um, the very last section of your homework packet isn't really based on notes, but really having you kind of combine some of the ideas that we've covered here and trying to think back at some of the things we've covered up to this point and kind of combining those, okay? All right, but this should cover our last part of notes. So here we go. Um, first of all, I just want to kind of define some things and start talking about radioactivity in terms of introductions. In the late 1890s, uh, they started discovering that some su substances were releasing radioactivity. In fact, the first few experiments, really, um, they thought that certain substances were absorbing energy from the sun and then releasing it at another time. And those experiments actually failed in the way that it didn't really match the hypothesis. Rather, what was happening is they were just emitting energy on their own. It had nothing to do with the sun. So they were emitting rays and different particles. Of course, they didn't know that at the time. They just knew it as energy. But the rays and particles and energy that's released from these substances is what we call the radiation. And this radiation is actually what we know now is a reaction that changes the nucleus of an atom. And therefore, we call them nuclear reactions. So this is the only type of reaction, not a physical change, not a chemical change, but this is the only reaction that can actually change one element into another. So there's several different types of radioactive decay. Again, this is this idea of unstable nuclei, losing energy, and emitting radiation. And this process is actually called decay. So unstable elements undergo this kind of decay process to try and form something that's a little more stable. And really, to figure out what is stable and what isn't, we have to look at one thing. And the primary reason for instability or radioactive decay is our ratio from neutrons to protons in the nucleus. The closer those, that ratio is to a one-to-one, -one, the more stable these, these substances are, the elements are. So when we look at that mass number and the atomic number, again, what we're looking at is we're trying to figure out what is the ratio between protons and neutrons. The closer it is to one-to-one, -to -one, the more stable the, the substance is. So any atoms that contain too many or too few neutrons tend to be unstable. Now, don't get me wrong. If it's not one-to-one, -one, it doesn't mean this thing's going to, you know, burst apart or anything like that. There is, you know, some gray area. There's actually what we call a zone of stability. So within reason, they're fine. But when this, this ratio, goes, ratio gets a little too out of whack, that's when the decay starts to happen. And this decay either releases extra neutrons to try to improve the, the ratio between them, or they can actually go through a beta process that uh, increases the number of neutrons for this to happen. Really, most of the substances that decay aren't really around anymore because most of them have already decayed into something else. While it takes a very long time, there's a long half-life for a lot of substances, uh, still most of them have already decayed into something else, far more, um, far more stable. So there's several different types of radiation, and I'm going to cover these, these types in terms of pretty much the, the least dangerous to the most dangerous types of radiation. And I also want to give you types um, or examples of radioactive, sorry, I want to give you types, <laughs> I want to give you um, examples of nuclear reactions for each type so you can really see what's going on here. So the first type we're going to talk about is alpha radiation. And in terms of radiation, alpha radiation is pretty bulky. And this is the one that's easiest to stop. It's the, the least dangerous of the three that we're really going to talk about. Um, alpha particles are actually helium nuclei. They are two protons and two neutrons, and they have a two plus charge to them. So it's really a helium nucleus and without the electron cloud. It's just that kind of packet there of energy and um, protons and neutrons. And this was found because when they found a substance that was releasing radioactivity, this this these particles were actually deflected towards a 
negatively charged plate that kind of like how we saw in the cathode ray tube where the cathode ray was leaning towards the positive electromagnet. Well, this is a similar idea where these are positive particles and they are being attracted to the negatively charged plate. Now, the symbols for the alpha particle can be written two ways. It can be written kind of like as this A right here, this kind of, um, it, well, it's Greek, but it almost looks like a cursive type A here. And this over here, you could also write it as a helium nucleus, as in four mass number as a superscript, and then two protons down at the bottom. Either one is completely acceptable. So a nuclear equation that has an alpha radiation or radioactive decay is going to have a reaction that ha starts with one substance and then breaks down into more than one substance. So this one in particular, we're going to do an example of radium-226. So what we're going to do is let me pull up a periodic table here, and we're going to look for radium. And radium, let me move this over here, radium is number 88 right here. And so radium 88 is what's going to decay. So we're going to start with that. We're going to have 226 up at the top. Okay, so that's our superscript. Then I'm going to have RA as the symbol. And we're also going to put a a subscript here because it is 88, radium 88, okay? And this is going to break down into several different things. Remember, this is the part that's unstable, so we have one substance that's gonna break down into a couple things. That's kind of what decay means, right? It's something that falls apart. So radium is going to lose a helium nucleus. So it's gonna lose four, pro fo sorry, four AMU, or two protons, two neutrons, so two protons. I'm gonna write it like that. And this is what it's gonna lose. So what we have to think about is what is left. So if I lost four AMU from 226, that's what I started with, what's going to be left? Well, we're gonna have 222 AMU left. And if we look at the protons, if I started with 88, protons with radium and I lost two with my helium nucleus, well I'm going to have 86 left. All right, so let's pull up our periodic table again. So if radium was 88, we're going to look at our periodic table here. Number 86 is radon. So that must be our other product. There. So again, let me just kind of summarize this one more time. I have radium is going to lose an alpha particle, which has a four AMU and two protons, and which leaves 222 AMU total and 86 protons. So if you look, I have down here at the bottom, it says the mass is conserved in a nuclear equation. I have 226 AMU going in. I have 226 AMU going out. I have 88 protons going in. I have 88 protons going out. So that is a, a classic example of an alpha particle decay. All right, so let's talk about the next one. The next one is a beta particle. And beta, beta radiation is a little bit more difficult to stop, um, basically because it's not as bulky. Beta radiation, for the most part, is emitting beta particles, which is a high-speed electron. So each beta particle has a negative one charge. It is basically, relatively um, speaking, is massless. And of course they found this because it was deflecting towards a positively charged plate, very much like the, our cathode ray. And our symbols for beta particle is either this kind of funky looking B here, this is a, a beta in our Greek alphabet, or you could just write it as an electron because that's really what it is. It's just a high speed electron that's being released. And so I included this, this picture here because I wanted to show you. So they have this radioactive source here and being emitted. Of course, it's being protected by this lead block. And as it's being emitted, they have this electromagnet over here, and they're seeing how these things are being deflected. The beta 
um, particle is being deflected towards the positive plate, the alpha towards the middle, and if you notice, the third one we're going to talk about is gamma here, and it's going straight through and it's not being deflected in either direction. That gamma, the reason why that's happening is because it doesn't have a charge at all. Let's go back to um, a beta negative nuclear reaction. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up here just to make sure you know it is beta negative because there is such a thing as beta positive. I'm going to pull up my periodic table again. And one thing that goes through beta negative um, nuclear decay very commonly is carbon 14. So if you see carbon right here, it's number six right here. And carbon 14 is pretty rare, but it is very common for carbon 14 to actually decay this way. So I'm going to put as a superscript 14 and number six, because carbon 14 has six protons. Okay, and this thing is going to fall apart as well. So again, like all nuclear reactions, we're going to start with a substance and then it's going to fall apart. This one is going to lose um, a beta particle. Oops. So we're going to put an electron like that. And now we have to start talking about what is left. Now here's the thing. If you remember, when we were talking in class, we were talking out about how a proton and neutron were very, very similar. In fact, the only difference was the proton had an up quark where a neutron had a down quark. So what really happens here is my six protons that I have, okay, and I have, and we're talking about just with the, the carbon-14 here, I have eight neutrons going into this. So what really happens is one of my neutrons splits apart and this one neutron actually turns into one proton plus one electron. Now, I'm simplifying this. I, I'm not gonna lie, I'm simplifying this a little bit. But basically, this neutral charge of a, a neutron, um, one of the quarks kind of switches teams here and we turn into a proton and an electron. Now this electron, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to move that. That electron right here is what's being released in the beta decay. So that's, that's where that thing's coming from. But our neutron switched teams and turned into a proton. So what that means is this is no longer carbon. My six protons just turned into seven. Now I still have a mass of 14 AMU because a neutron and a proton have the same mass. So that didn't change. I'm still at 14. Okay, but what I need to do is pull up my periodic table here and figure out who is number seven. And if you look, when I increase the proton number from a six to a seven, I turn into nitrogen. So my carbon now has seven protons, which makes it no longer carbon, and now it's nitrogen. All right, so this is a classic example of beta negative decay. Again, I'm starting with one substance of 14 AMU and six protons. One of my neutrons here, my eight neutrons in carbon-14, splits apart, forming one proton and one electron, therefore changing the identity of my element. So I go from a carbon, which is number six, to a nitrogen that's number seven without changing the AMU. So I have a total mass of 14 AMU on both sides, and I've lost an electron. Okay. Now this can go actually um, in another, there's another type of beta decay. It doesn't have to be beta minus. In fact, this, this top row here is really the one that I just gave you an example of. And I'm not going to get into the anti-neutrino and the neutrino. That's really kind of beyond this class. Um, but just so you know, there, there are more products than just the electron. But I've got a carbon-14 and beta minus that turns into a nitrogen-14 and releases an electron. Now the beta plus decay is a little bit different. Instead of going up in protons, it actually goes down. So in this case, I have a proton that's falling apart and forming a neutron. So it's a little bit in reverse of what our beta minus decay looks like. And this one, the beta plus decay, loses a positive 
electron or a posit positron. Okay, so beta negative releases a negative electron, a beta positive releases a positron. These are both leptons, they just have opposite charges. All right, so in this beta decay, like I said, a neutrino is a lepton and an ele another type of elementary particle that's being released. It has no net electrical charge, and an antineutrino is actually an antiparticle of a neutrino. But that's, that's really about as far as I'm going to get into that. Again, anything beyond that's really past the scope of the class. Now this whole process of beta decay is part of this thing called transmutation. And anytime we have something that is transmutating, we have a reaction that is altering the atom's atomic number or its identity. A positron, just to go back to that, is a particle with the same mass as an electron but with an opposite charge. Again, it's also part of the lepton family. An electron capture it occurs when the nucleus of the atom is actually pulling in a surrounding electron and then combines with a proton to form a neutron. So what I'm saying is I'm not covering all the different types of nuclear decay. There are different things that can happen like electron capture and so forth, um, but we're going to just kind of cover just the basics here. And as I was mentioning before, we have something that's called a zone of stability. When I was saying if we had too many neutrons, okay, we can go through a type of decay to try and get rid of some of those extra, extra neutrons and try to improve the ratio between protons and neutrons. And if we have an isotope with too many neutrons, they tend to go through beta negative decay. And this helps um, a neutron become a proton and improve that, that ratio. If it has too many protons, then it tends to go through beta positive decay. And this helps a proton turn into a neutron and again, improve that, that ratio. Now for the third and final type of radioactive decay, and we have what's called gamma rays. Now, gamma rays are extremely high energy radiation. They don't have mass and they're neutral, which means they are extremely difficult to stop. These, these are the things that you really have to be um, worried about when it comes to radiation. By themselves, they really can't form anything else because they're really just energy. Um, anything that's going through gamma radiation is not losing a particle, it's not changing a particle, so it's not really changing identities. Gamma has a symbol that kind of looks like this uh, funky look looking Y. It's kind of a um, capital cursive looking Y. And gamma, gamma radiation Nuclear decay is really going to be some of the easiest ones you're ever going to have to ever write. So we're going to look at this periodic table again. And something that goes through gamma radiation is very common is uranium. And we'll just say uranium-238 to give you an example. All right, so I'm going to write 238 as a superscript for the mass number. And then I'm going to put 92 for uranium. And uranium starts to release this gamma decay, this gamma radiation. And what's left is the same thing. Like I said, gamma radiation by itself cannot change an atom. It's not losing anything but energy. Okay? All right, so those are your three types of radiation that you really need to know about. Um, to summarize things up on a table here, I gave you a list of all the symbols. Okay, we've got uh, alpha decay right here. We've got the four and the two and the helium, or you can write it as this uh, alpha symbol here. You can write beta decay as an electron or the capital B with a, a tail there, or the gamma with the Y. Any of those will work. Um, I do want you to know the AMU, the relative masses of each of these, Alpha has four total AMU, two protons, two neutrons. The beta is an electron, so you could even put a relative mass of zero right here. And gamma truly is zero. It's massless. You don't have to know anything along the kilograms, the actual mass I'm not worried about. However, the charge I am, because alpha has two protons, it has a positive two charge. Beta has an electron, so it's a negative one charge, and gamma no charge, it's neutral. 
So you do need to know those for the, for the quiz and the test. Now there's lots of different types of what we call dis decay series. In other words, there's very heavy unstable elements that break down in a pattern. And uranium-238 is, is one of these. So this is a very common decay series here. So if we look, uranium, here's where it starts. And if we follow this graph down, we see where the mass number is 238. And if we follow it over, we see that uranium is number 92, which is the number of protons. So uranium-238 being unstable, if you think about it, if only having 92 protons and a total mass number of 238 has way too many neutrons. So this thing goes through this process to eventually try and equalize the proton to neutron ratio. Now while it's not going to get it perfect, it's far better than what it started with. So we see this line, this red arrow here means an alpha decay and then a blue one means a beta, negative decay. So uranium goes, again, through this process and eventually turns into a stable isotope of lead, eventually. So on the quiz and the test, what I'm going to ask you to do is to read this chart and try and give me a couple of these examples here. All right, so let me, let me just do a couple. And we're going to start with uranium at the very top. So I'm looking at uranium-238. Again, that's the mass number. 238, and if we follow uranium all the way over here, we see the atomic number of 92. We're going to put the symbol, and uranium is going to fall apart. It says the first step is actually an alpha decay, so that means it's losing that helium nucleus. So I'm going to put a 4 for 4 AMU, I'm going to put a 2 for the two protons, put a helium, Plus, now let's think about it. What did uranium turn into? If it started with 238 AMU, it lost four. That means it went to 232, or sorry, 234. That's what's left. It lost four, it turned into 234. The protons, it lost two protons, so it turns, I have now 90 protons left. So again, I'm going to pull up my periodic table and I'm going to look for number 90, which is down here at the very bottom, and I see thorium is number 90, so TH. So through that first alpha decay, I have uranium-238 turning into thorium-234. All right, I'm going to do one more here. I'm going to show you the beta decay going up. So I'm going to start with the thorium. 234. Now thorium is going to fall apart, but thorium is going to lose that electron, which means, let's look up here at the chart, thorium is turning into Pa, so it's going up one. But all the numbers are right here. If you look, Pa does not lose any of the mass, so I still have this superscript of 234. That didn't change. However, my number of protons did. If we look over here, I went from 90 protons to 91 protons, and that is because one of my neutrons split and turned into a proton. So we could even pull this up on the periodic table here, and we're looking at Pa down here, number 91. So that gives you an example of both an alpha decay off the decay series or a beta decay off um, the decay series. You're going to be able to pick which ones you want to represent, but you will have to show at least one of each. So just kind of take a look at that and, and see if that, that makes any sense. Okay. And the last thing I want to cover in this video, and I know it's kind of getting long, but I do want to talk a little bit about radiochemical dating, like other uses. Um, other than just having this kind of scary radiation, there's actually some pretty practical uses for it. Um, and with this radiochemical dating, we have a calculation called half-life. Okay, so for example, carbon undergoes a beta decay process, just like the one we had for an example, carbon-14, and it turns into nitrogen. 
So carbon-14 in general has this half-life of 5,730 years. Um, and typically, the amount of stable carbon in something that's dead remains constant, while carbon-14 continues to decay. So if we know what this ratio is in a fossil, we can actually start to determine how old it is because at the point um, that it died, it has this, this standard percentage of carbon-14. But then as it continues to decay, so does carbon-14. And then the ratio um, changes. And when that ratio changes, they can actually decide how long it has changed and how long it, well, how long it's taken. So they can, within reason, figure out how old the fossil is. So half-life is determined from this formula right here. It's kind of like the formula of n's is like how I like to think of it because it's n equals no, which is the original amount. That's what that O stands for. One half to the nth power. The little n is how long it's been uh, or how many ha half-lives have passed during this time frame. The one thing you kind of have to keep in mind, this is a ratio, the time passed over the half-life. These have to be in the same units. In other words, you can't say 12 days have passed if the half-life is 5,000 years. You have to say how many years have passed in 5,000 years. Let me, let me give you an example, see if this, this helps, okay? My first example is Krypton 85, and it's used as an indicator light actually in appliances. The half-life of Krypton 85 is 11 years. How much of a two milligram sample remains after 33 years? Okay, well, I'm gonna go back here and I'm going to copy this formula so we can take a look at it. N is how much remains. NO is the original amount, so it says two milligrams is what we started with, okay? And I'm gonna fill in one half here. Now we have to figure out the one half to the nth power. And it says, I'm gonna put a little caret key here, how much has remained after 33 years? So what I want here is 33, that's how much time has passed, and the half-life is 11. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do in my calculator is I'm gonna take 33 divided by 11. Time passed divided by half-life, and both of which are in years, so these have to be in the same unit. I divide those two, I take one half to that power, so one half to the third power, multiplied by two milligrams, okay? And, let's see here, I've got, so one half, you guys have your calculators here. We've got one half to the third power, which is 0.125 times two, which means I have 0.25 milligrams left. All right, so let's look at sig figs since this is what my calculator told me. Okay, I have two here, two here, three here, my answer is going to have two. So that's how much remains after three half-lives. And as I'm trying to kind of um, get you in the habit of doing, I want you to kind of think if this makes sense. Half-life means half of it is gone, right? So after one half-life, two would turn into one, okay? After two half-lives, one would turn into one half. Three half-lives, my one half would turn into a quarter. So this makes perfect sense, okay? All right, um, my second example problem is, is listed here. I would like for you to try it on your own. Um, and let me know if you have any questions, okay? I know this video went a little longer than I was hoping, but this should round things out and hopefully things go well this week. Please, please, please let me know if you have any questions, okay? Take care.